Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of JAX Live. I'm your host, Rick Huntress, Director of Business Development at the Jackson Laboratory. Today, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to introduce my colleague, Dr. Aaron Rose, Senior Program Manager for Oncology Pharmacology. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. So Aaron's focus is on the execution of early stage discovery studies in unique in vivo platforms, uh, particularly the humanized models that are run at JAX. So today we're gonna to be discussing ways that JAX can support custom humanization projects. And we're gonna be talking about a, a unique strain called the NBSGW or NSG kit. Uh, before we jump in though, as a reminder to our audience, please be, uh, you're welcome to use the comment box to submit your questions or add a comment or even send us a shout out uh, wherever you are in the world. It's always interesting to see where folks are tuning in from. We'll answer as many of those questions as we can during the, the event and then we'll also follow up afterwards. Uh, so JAX has several study ready humanized mouse models. Uh, most folks are familiar with those and they're available for purchase or studies here at JAX, but with over 10,000 strains in our repository, uh, we have experience using a wide variety of models and an in vivo team who, who uses those, those models regularly. So how do you understand if another strain is more important for your study? What are the options you might have for that specialized humanized, humanized mouse study? So Aaron, let's start by talking about the, the NBSGW. Um, what is it and what makes it different than the other NSG strains? Yeah, I mean, I, I think obviously the first thing to think about is that the NBSGW is indeed an NSG, that is a, a non-skid gamma mouse, so it's, it's already baseline immunocompromised. Um, but on top of that, it has these dual kit W41 mutations that lead it to being genetically myel myeloablative. And that means that we don't need to take extra steps in order to clear the stem cell niche. You don't need to ablate with busulfan. You don't need to irradiate. Uh, so this strain is a wonderful strain for hematopoietic stem cell and graft experimentation. So um, that that's a, is an obvious difference because with the NSGs and and the other transgenic strains, we are we are myeloablating. What would be some of the specific applications that that uh, might apply for the the NBSGW? Yeah, typically uh, the kind of work that's being done with the NBSGW relates to gene therapies targeting sickle cell anemia or other bone marrow based genetic diseases. Those that you might treat with uh, uh, radiation or uh, myeloablation in a human being and then transferring uh, bone marrow to, to cure the disease. Uh, researchers can also use them to study hematopoiesis of transplanted hematopoietic stem cells just to understand the hematopoiesis process. Um, the nice part about uh, the hematopoiesis that happens in these mice is that you don't have to worry about the off-target effects of your ablation. Uh, whether it's radiation or busulfan, uh, that ablation is going to affect normal hematopoiesis. It's going to affect uh, the gastric system, it'll affect the brain and the neurological system. And so you don't have to worry about those potential side effects in that research. The last point I'd make is that it's not necessarily an efficacy related platform. So there aren't uh, mutations here related to particular diseases. Instead, it's really a tool uh, for studying hematopoiesis. Uh, under various conditions. And one of those approaches is as using it as a QA platform. Uh, and that QA platform can be for assessing uh, editing approaches uh, leading to gene edited cell therapies. That's a good point, Aaron. You know, I typically when we think about uh, where JAX uh, executes studies, it's often early discovery. We're, uh, we're often looking at uh, genetic models of human disease. So when you talk about this platform as being not an efficacy platform, more of a QA, um, it does, it is a different kind of conversation. Tell me a little bit more, what are the QA readouts that, that you might expect to see in, in one of these studies? Yeah, there's, there's some, some pretty obvious readouts. Uh, the first amongst them is confirmation of engraftment. If you transfer uh, human hematopoietic stem cells to these mice, do they engraft? Uh, beyond that, you might be comparing gene expression. So you're using different vectors in your different hematopoietic stem cells. 
to uh, gene edit, and then you want to see the downstream gene and gene product expression and what it looks like in a live setting or in an EVO setting. Uh, you can look for off-target uh, or in other integration effects that might be causing problems with your downstream product or with the phenotype of the cells or the phenotype of the lineages that derive from the cells. Uh, it'll allow you to confirm and look for changes in hematopoiesis. Uh, and not just in, in an acute or a short term, but over a long term, you can watch those changes uh, in hematopoiesis and those changes in the uh, availability of the downstream lineages. Uh, and, and the last one I bring up, and one of the really most important ones when we're talking about things like safety studies, is uh, for tracking of spontaneous tumors, verifying that your editing technique doesn't cause uh, unintended off target effects that lead to carcinogenesis. Well, that's really helpful, Aaron. Thank you. So, for clients who are interested in working with a specialized model, like this. Can you talk through some of the things that JAX provides for, for groups that, that work with us? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a few different ways we, we can uh, uh, support folks work. I mean, the first thing that we can do is we can ship out these strains. So we sell them from our, our mouse production group, uh, and those folks are breeding these strains and selling them uh, uh, at the need of the researchers out there working with them. We also have experience with engrafting these mice with uh, the normal cord blood derived CD34s that we are very experienced working with. Uh, we can engraft them with human PBMCs, or we can even use customer modified CD34 positive cells. And oftentimes when we are working with customer modified CD34 uh, positive cells, uh, often those are mobilized and we use them in the context of these vector confirmation studies and in the context uh, of these safety studies that folks might contract us to run for them. You know, um, Aaron, I was thinking about, and I've had a couple of conversations with clients and I remember one of the things that came up here was many folks who are using this mouse in-house are working with CD34 that's, uh, they engraft fresh. It's gone, it's either IPS derived and they've done some modification and they're engrafting it, it fresh. Um, but my expectation would be that's that's going to be difficult in a, in a setting. So do we work with clients to help them uh, introduce a freeze step? And, and how does that impact, say, pilot studies or, or other ways we work with clients who want to externalize some of this? Yeah, I, I would say that that's one of the most critical aspects of these kinds of studies is early stage communication and adapting our, our existing processes to that which will ultimately suit the experimental needs of the client who's bringing the study to us. Uh, whether that's running a small pilot to verify that an intermediate free step does not have deleterious effect on engraftment. Um, whether that's figuring out some other process to actually bring live cells, live fresh cells to us, that is something oh, sure. we've had to do in the past. Um, I think that that uh, we do a uniquely good job of engaging very early in, in very in-depth conversations around the building of things like our study protocols. Um, so I look forward to uh, folks reaching out to us as a result of the discussion today and, and having some of those in-depth conversations. So you, you talked about um, some of the different kinds of studies. I, I think we referred to them as, a say, a vector confirmation study and then um, also a safety study. Can you, can you give us a little bit more of a, an insight into maybe some of the differences between those, those kinds of studies? Yeah, absolutely. I tend to think of one of them as an early stage and the other as a late stage. Um, early stage uh, engraftment or vector confirmation studies are about looking at different approaches for, for the gene editing in these somatopoietic stem cells and evaluate them, evaluating them in an in vivo uh, context. Looking to see if, if all of those factors that we mentioned above are most efficacious in one uh, approach versus another approach for their editing. Once we've landed on and finalized an editing approach, I say we, once our client has landed on and finalized an editing approach, uh, that's the stage at which we want to plan out this safety study, this larger scale safety study, tons of planning that goes in, um, uh, plan for on-site audits, uh, plans for remote audits, uh, um, plans for taking a whole bunch of tissue at the end. So in an engraftment study, we've got, we're taking blood at various time points and we're running flow cytometry. At the very end of the study, we're looking at uh, spleen, bone marrow, 
and peripheral blood to get an idea of what lineages are represented and to collect tissues for DNA testing to look at the vector or gene products. Um, in the context of the safety studies, we're taking everything, right? And we're doing pathology. We're looking for tumorigenesis. We're verifying that there are no uh, negative phenotypes potentially associated with those human hematopoietic stem cells that have been grafted. So, and my assumption is when we're talking with a safety team or compliance uh, from the client side, um, that's a more complex discussion. And it would typically include things like an, an audit. Um, is that something we can do at JAX? Do we have experience working with these kind of safety and compliance groups? Absolutely. We, we uh, really uh, heavily encourage uh, audits. We want people, we get to learn from audits, right? We want people to, to audit our documentation. We want them to audit our, our data retention policies, to come into the vivarium and see our vivarium, how our processes work, ask us questions about why and how we do everything. And that's largely, at least in the context of a safety study, that's largely really critical to, to a team's success in taking a safety study and incorporating it into an IND uh, application to the FDA. Uh, and, I, and I would mention uh, that we don't uh, do our work uh, in a GLP environment. So it becomes really critical that the outside QA group be able to establish uh, that we have really, really strong uh, SOPs, strong processes in general, and a great quality operation. Uh, and and I would al we always also encourage our clients to reach out directly to the FDA and start a conversation with them and let them know exactly what their plans are as they approach uh, their IMD using a safety study from the Thanks, Aaron. Um, so, in the current environment, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't kind of layer COVID on top of this. Has COVID impacted your team's ability to bring in work or execute studies, or, or how are you functioning in this kind of environment uh, that we're in right now? Yeah, I think I think everybody's been affected by COVID. Uh, uh, I guess that's the nature of a pandemic, um, and and. I think that we've had uh, a unique situation in that we had multiple ongoing safety studies as the uh, uh, situation was evolving. And so we evolved with it and we worked with our clients, we worked with the outside auditors and we were able to set up remote audits. We're using remote auditing tools now where we can actually share our SOPs. We can do it all in real time, we can provide uh, offline access to our SOPs in a method that we're secure with <clears throat> such that our clients can really do a, a, an excellent audit. And then on top of that, uh, we recently actually found some auditors that were local that we were comfortable with bringing into our facilities. Uh, biosecurity is a big question at this stage, right? You, you don't want to potentially introduce uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 to your workforce and then not have the workforce that you need to maintain the mice. So we're, we're very diligent about that, but we also try to remain agile to make sure that our clients get what they need at the end of the day. That's great news. Um, and uh, I know many of uh, our clients have had to, to close or alter their workflows. Um, and I think our ability to stay open has been um, well responded to. And I'd expect us to do a little bit more of this work. Um, if somebody's interested in talking with Jax about um, outsourcing a study, uh, who do they call? Uh, you know, we're we're all ready to have a conversation. But a good starting place is with your local opportunity development representative. Um, there's also another good option uh, to go with mice tech at jax.org. Uh, that email is going to take you to our. Uh, technical information scientists. I actually used to be one of them and love that job. And they are smart folks ready to have a conversation with you and uh, help answer some of your early questions and get you uh, involved with the right folks to have this conversation. Um, you can also schedule a meeting online. I, I see a link here. I think there may be a link below. Uh, if there isn't, I'm sure we can add a link to this after the fact uh, in which you can go to our website and schedule a meeting to discuss with us. Thanks, Aaron. So I, we covered a lot of ground today. Um, we've confirmed Jax has experience with this strain in-house. Uh, we've done 
cord blood, adult mobilized CD34. We've done cord blood CD34, adult mobilized, and gene modified versions of both. Um, we've run the early phase vector confirmation studies, and as well as the detailed safety studies. Um, we can support audits on site and the regulatory compliance over, uh, oversight that's required. And I think I'll add from my experience, the FDA is familiar with JAX in this role and the kind of data that we've generated. So this is not a new proposition for us. I think that it's news for some folks that we're doing this, but it's um, a reflection of the, the quality of the models and the development that we're able to execute these studies. Um, so I'm gonna have to say, unfortunately, we're out of time. If we weren't able to answer your questions, please be sure uh, to submit them online and we'll follow up or you can reach out to us as Aaron uh, mentioned at our technical information science team, micetech at jax.org. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Aaron, for the discussion today. And I wish everyone a, a good day or a good evening, whichever you're looking forward to. Thank you, everyone. Have a great one.